I was thinking about salmon. Why, why have we come to this house in Old Basing? Well, this might look like just any old bungalow in any small village, but it, actually, if we go in the back garden now, we'll get to see several thousand young salmon. Okay. Okay. Let's do it. <coughs> Okay, not your average backyard, is it, Daryl? Not your average backyard, no. <laughs> What's going on? What we've got here is basically a salmon rearing facility where we've got an excellent water supply from the river which just runs through the whole of their back garden. Feeds all these tanks here and in this facility we can rear up to about 20 or 30,000 fish from about 2 centimetres long up to about 15, 16 centimetre long smolts. Okay, so that's what we've got in these tanks here, is it? Yeah. Should we go and have a look? Yeah, it's good. Okay, find out, Lou. Come on. Are you going <laughs> to give your hands? Come on, Tom. There we go. Okay. Okay, now if we just take these clips off and push this back a bit, you can see Wow, here. fish. Can we see that? Fish galore. Several thousand salmon. These fish will be about 10 months old. They're actually from eggs that we bought in Ireland, from the River Shannon system in Ireland. Right. And then they were they were hatched in an agricultural college in Hampshire, and then they were brought here to grow on until we need them next March, and we put them back in the river. So the, the salmon obviously haven't gone extinct in the Shannon in Ireland. Were they similar kinds of, of, of salmon to the salmon we would have had here? No, each river has its own genetically distinct population of salmon. So in the Thames we didn't have anything to work with. We didn't have a native population because it was extinct in 1830s. So we chose a river that has a similar length and a similar geology to the Thames in, in some respects. Right, so did and you have to look at a lot of rivers to come to that conclusion? We looked at quite a few, but we were looking for basically a natural stock of, of fish uh, on a river that had surplus stock, really, that had fish to spare. Right, it's, it's really, I mean, it's to me, reintroduction like this is one of the most exciting things in conservation, because it's like, it's, it's, it's undoing the wrongs that we've done in the past. Conservation of the fish and bringing it back has been a really. Come on then, Louis. Go around this side. Come on, Lou. Come on then. Come on. Come on then. Good boy. So the conservation of the salmon has been a really complicated process, and we're going to talk about that. But first of all. They're not the easiest animal to work with, are they? They're kind of, they're awkward. They do, they have a really complicated life cycle. Yeah. <laughs> How does it work? <coughs> they, they're very complicated because they have a difficult life cycle and because they live in some very clean conditions, which makes them very difficult to work with. Their life cycle starts up in the little tributary rivers of, of a river catchment, where the, the water's quite shallow, fast flowing and very clean. So they lay the eggs and die. The eggs will stay in the gravels for a few months, depending on the temperature of the water that they're in. And then they'll hatch into small um, life stage called the alvin, which lives off its own little yolk sack. It carries around its, its lunch in a little sack underneath oh, it okay. for a few weeks. And then they'll turn to fry and par, and they'll, they'll spend about a year after they've hatched in fresh water living, eating the invertebrates and stuff like that in the riverbed. And then after a year, they'll be about 15 centimetres long by then, and then they undergo an, in, an incredible physiological change. They go from being what are called par, and they change shape and they change colour and their skin changes, and they become smolts, and smolts are designed to go to sea. And so you get these fish that are 100 miles away from the sea, they just suddenly get to around March time each year, and they decide to go off to sea and they move down the little tributaries into the main river in the Thames they go down through London and out to sea and they're heading for the Faroe Islands or Greenland Right. and they feed off the coasts there 
where there's loads of food for them to eat and they grow, eno they grow enormously in that, in that year or two that they spend off the coast of Greenland and the Faroe Islands. And they'll go from about 15 centimetres to about 60 centimetres in, in 12 months. So and that's the salmon we're used to seeing, the big salmon that we eat. Yeah, those are the adult fish. And they're the ones that are heading back after a year at sea, they're heading back to exactly the same spot where they were spawned, in the same river, in the same tributary. They've got tremendous homing instincts. How many have. miles is that? Do we know? Well, it depends on how far they go, really, but it's several thousand miles on a round trip is just it? to go and feed. What? So what is that? that's why they go, to get a particular type of food, is it? Well, they go because in fresh water, there isn't really a lot of food there for them. They can, they can survive in fresh water for a while, but they really need to get big so that they can produce lots and lots of eggs. Right. Because mortality for salmon in the river, naturally produced salmon in rivers, is very, very high. So they get eaten by lots of other things? Or, or they die. I mean, a, an average female salmon will probably lay about three or 4,000 eggs, of which you would hope that uh, two would survive to adults. Humans so much... have the opposite strategy, don't we? We actually have few young but we put loads and loads of energy and attention into raising them yeah. whereas fish kind of have loads and loads of eggs and they lay them on the, the riverbed and then they they the, die they die fact, the don't salmon they? Do, which yeah. is another kind of interesting biological phenomenon isn't it yeah is, there, is it semel paris is that the word for it yes when they <laughs> so when they sort of just kind of put all of their energy into this one reproductive event that's right then they die Okay, so they've come back, and then what happens? How do they, how do they go about the process of breeding? What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> what does it look like? How does it work? Well, what happens is the, the male and the female fish will pair up on these gravelly areas of fish. Oh, fish. Tell us about the birds and the bees, Daryl. Yeah. <laughs> well, when, when two fish love each other... Yeah, two <laughs> fish love each other. I, it, this, that's, is that biologically correct? I don't think... It, we don't know. They might love each other, of course. Um, well, they're prepared to die with each other, I suppose. They are. They're prepared yeah. to die. It's kind of love, sex, death. Sort of, it is. It's a story of transcontinental movements and... It's, it's a soap opera, just waiting to it happen. It is, you know, and coming back, you know, the prodigal son coming back to roost in the, yeah. the home stream. <laughs> okay, no, okay. The, the two, the male and the female will pair up oh, on these areas of gravels which are suitable for them, and the female will use her body to, to dig a, what's called a red or a nest, about 15 centimetres deep. It's basically a hollow in the river bed, in the gravel bed, and she'll pick an area where there's a there's a good flow of water through the gravel because if it's too silty, the silt will drop out onto the eggs that are laid there and the eggs will get smothered and die, there won't be enough oxygen getting to them. So she has to pick her spot really carefully and she'll, in some rivers she'll dig various little scrapes just to see what the gravel's like and not decide it's not suitable and then she'll move on somewhere else. Because you've recruited Sam, fish fanatic. Who we're going to go and get now, aren't we? That's right. Let's yeah. go and get Sam. Right. I'll, get, I'll get Sam. Sam. Why do I like yeah, them? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Find it interesting. And gives us something to do every day. Yeah, to look after. <laughs> <laughs> so, you get over there? Or yeah, I get over there. Okay, so what do we do every day? We come down and you say. Yeah. Well, first of all, we feed them. 
Okay, anyway. so we're going to go and do that then, are yeah, we? Yeah. Right. right. Okay, and that gradually winds down and drops more food in over yeah, the so day. Yeah, so it keeps okay. sprinkling it in as it goes. Okay, so it gives them a certain amount of food. That's right. Right. Okay. That's it. Right, we do that. Yeah. And then what do we do, then, Sam? Uh, we get the brush and take down the... Right, can we get the brush then? There we go. And I'll show you what we're going to do. Okay. Can I do it? Or no, no. Oh no. Here you are then. That's just to make sure that it's all clean and the water's running properly. Running properly, yeah. Oh. And is that it, Sam? Yeah, that's about it, yeah. So yeah. what did you do before you um before you did this? Before you looked after the salmon? Watercress. Thank you very much Thanks. for showing us your, your no, salmon yeah, yeah, and for letting us invade your garden, Sam. Well, Sam does a fantastic job at making sure the fish survive to this stage. But another crucial part of reintroducing an animal is to make sure that the habitat, once they get out into the wild, is right. In the second half of Wild, we'll be looking at what Daryl and his team have been doing on the rivers to ensure that the salmon can complete their amazing life cycle out to the sea and back again. Welcome back to Wild on 6TV, the Oxford channel, which this week is all about salmon. Not the ones that you bake in the oven or grill, but uh, real life uh, live kicking salmon being reintroduced onto the River Thames. And I'm joined by Daryl Clifton Day from the Environment Agency. And Daryl, we're looking now at how the agency has worked to make the rivers more fish friendly, aren't we? That's right, yeah. We're going to look at one of the weirs on the river and how we get fish over it. Right, go. Okay, Sasha, we're at the weir, the dogs have to stay, I'm afraid, and you have to put on a life jacket in case you fall in. Right, okay, so shall I tie them up? Yeah, if you could tie the dogs up somewhere. Is this all right here? Yeah, that'd be fine. Let's go. That like that. goes in there, yeah, that arm goes through there. And then hmm. buckle at the pump, and we'll tighten you up in a minute. Right, <laughs> good idea. Oh, our cameraman has to have a life jacket. He does. Come on then, Tom. Yeah, give me the camera. Do you want to help, help him, Adam? Yep, yeah, it's just like a waist. A waist okay. Coat. Uh, like that. Oh, like that. no, that one. So what, this doesn't look like it's going to sort of stop me from drowning, Daryl. No, if you hit the water, it's got an automatic bottle of gas in here that goes off and inflates all this and keeps your head above water. Keeps you buoyant. Keeps you alive, yeah. Okay, should we test them recently? We test them very regularly. Okay on students. <laughs> right, let's go. <laughs> okay, so Daryl, we've come to this end of the weir uh, to get away from the noise. It's very noisy over there. Um, and we're going to talk about what you've done to this weir to allow the salmon through. But first of all, what is a weir? A weir is basically like a brick wall that's been put into the river to hold back water so there's a certain depth above the weir that allows boat traffic to get upstream up to the next weir. Now there's a lock on this weir as well which allows the boats to get up over the weir themselves. But there's nothing to allow 
the salmon or any other fish species to get up this weir until we put in the fish ladder. But why do people build brick walls in the middle of rivers? For boat traffic, either to get uh, goods up to places like Oxford along the river or to get recreational boats upstream. Is that so that the water sort of banks up more on one side and keeps the water deeper? Yeah, you're basically creating... This is actually the 20th weir on the River Thames from the estuary. And it's basically 20 pools that the boats come up to a, a, a weir and then there's water held behind the weir and the boats get up over the weir and then they're in deeper water that's at a certain depth to allow them to get up to the next weir and then there'll be another wall. It's like 20 steps up a river. I guess the water would sort of spread out much more over the countryside yeah. and, and be much shallower and then the, the big boats couldn't get through. Is, is that right? Yeah, the, the water would be shallower. There'd be a lot more movement to the bed of the river as well. So that's why we built weirs, but the consequences of that for the salmon have been that they can't carry on this extraordinary life cycle that they've got, which we described in the first half, where they go all the way from the little tributaries and streams right out to the, to the open sea and up to the, to the North Sea, in fact, and, and back again. They can't do that if there's brick walls in the way. How did that affect the salmon? Well, it basically stops them. It's a complete barrier to all fish species, not just salmon. Even the, the resident species of fish in the river, like bream and, and chub and dace and barbel and pike, they end up getting locked into a certain reach of the river, unable to get upstream or downstream as well. And the salmon, it was particularly bad because there were so many weirs and because they need to get upstream to complete their life cycle. It basically meant they couldn't get upstream and therefore there was no chance of a salmon population returning to the river. So really at that point, they were just lost. And when, when was that? Well, the weirs were actually put in after most of the problems in the water quality in London that killed off the salmon population. So in about the, from about the 1850s up to the 1950s were when the weirs were built. Pollution killed them off, and then the weirs just kind of stopped them from coming back That's right. when the water quality improved, which it, which it did do, didn't it? It has improved, definitely. The water quality now supports an enormous diversity of fish species now in the river. Because at that point you had lots of pollutants going into the river from sort of industry in the Thames, which, uh, which was kind of, you described it as causing a kind of a polluted kind of stop yeah. gap, like a, a plug. And the fish, any fish going through there, didn't do very well. It was, it was basically a chemical barrier uh, where there was about 20 miles of river that was biologically dead, really. There were no species of fish alive in there at all from 1850 to 1950, really, in about 20 miles of river. So any migratory species that had to actually get through London couldn't get through this plug of water. Right, OK. And that gradually improved? That did improve after they started building sewage treatment works on the River Thames and treating the, the water that went out into the river. It became cleaner and fish species started to return quite rapidly through the 60s and the 70s. Until now there's over 100 species of fish in the Thames. I think there's 119 species of fish at the last count because we've started getting some in the last few years as well which are quite rare species like lamprey and shad have been found in the Thames and, and they're adding to the numbers of, of fish that we had previously too. Really good news, they're coming back. Okay, so that removed that problem, but then obviously they had this weir problem, and we're standing, we are standing on a weir, we <laughs> and we're going to go and have a look at how you've, you've tried to solve this weir problem. Yeah. Yeah, this well, brick wall in the river problem. We're going to put a ladder against it. Right. So can fish climb ladders? They can if they're sort of watery, fishy ladders. Special fishy ladders. That's okay, right. We're going to go and have a look. Okay. okay. This is a fish pass. Some people call it a fish ladder, right. and it looks sort of ladder-like. It's uh, basically a concrete chute with these metal plates that are bolted to the bottom and the side walls of it, and it's these that slow the water down. But if you didn't have the metal plates and you let the water go, it would be just like a slide, a water slide. The, the water flow would be really fast, and fish wouldn't be able to swim up it. But these plates slow the water down, and although it looks very turbulent and fast, it isn't. It's actually 
slow enough to allow most species of fish, including salmon and other fish in the river, to get upstream and get up over the weir and to find new habitat or move on its way to spawning grounds. Now I know this sounds a bit silly, Daryl, but so forgive me, but don't fish get a bit sore on their bellies when they swim over those? They, they don't actually ever touch them. Right. Because of the way the water flows over them, fish don't actually come into contact with the metal at any point. Okay, so they literally just swim along this canal in the centre. That's right, yeah. In the middle. Okay, and you, the Environment Agency, um, have specially constructed this. Yeah. Um, how much does it cost? These cost about 40 to 50,000 pounds each, these fish passes. Now, it's not just money from the Environment Agency, though. There's a charitable organisation called the Thames Salmon Trust, which was formed in 1986, and they've managed to raise over £2 million to help build fish passes on the Thames and on the River Kennet as well to get these salmon back upstream to spawning areas. Do people find it very inspiring, the idea of bringing the salmon back then? They obviously were successful at raising that money. It is an inspiring thing. It's, it's sort of like a, a totem species. People associate the salmon with clean water conditions, they, they've heard about the, the decline of salmon around the world and they think that it's a good thing to support the Thames salmon population, I think. Brilliant. OK, well, it's a bit noisy here, isn't it? So we're just going to go and have a look at the Thames a bit further down, aren't we? OK. A bit more tranquil. Okay, so you've got fish coming in, but you've got one last final hurdle for them, haven't you? We have, yeah. There's 37 weirs, and we've actually built fish passes on 36 of them right. to date. And we're building the last one at the moment, and it should be ready by the middle of December. And then, after we've built all 37 fish passes, then things are going to start getting interesting, I think, because then we have to show that fish can actually use the fish passes, find them, get upstream, spawn naturally and then we might be able to get a self-sustaining salmon population back to the river which would be fantastic because that'll be the moment of truth for you won't it Darryl? it will yeah working with the salmon for eight years that's right yeah um and it's <laughs> going to be make or break time within the next three to five you're going to get that's be the moment when people say did he make it did it work did daryl bring the salmon back to the thames daryl and all the all the uh, loads of people that have helped you exactly yeah Loads of people have worked before me on this scheme, um, with me on this scheme, so it's a, it's a very much a team effort. Okay, and, and what else does the project involve? Because we've seen the little baby fish in the first part of the show mm -hmm. in, in a garden yes. in Old Basing, and we've seen the weir. What else do you have to do to make the river right for the salmon and to bring them back? Well, we're actually trying to restore a population by stocking fish as well, and we stock young fish to, to nursery areas as well in June each year, several thousand of them to some of the nursery streams. And then we go looking for them again around November, October time. We stock other fish around March, and then in the summer from June all the way through to September, we're actually getting adult fish back into the river, and we're monitoring those as they move upstream over the weirs and fish passes. And you're continuing to do that? You're continuing to put fish into the river? We will do for the short term at least. We have to really, because if you don't put young in, you don't get any adults back and you don't know if your fish passes are working. You don't get any fish to any spawning areas, so you don't know if your, if your spawning areas are, are good enough for them. So you have to really speculate to accumulate. OK. And one of the things you mentioned was going and finding out how many fish you've got. Mm. And we're going to be joining you when you do that That's next right. week, aren't we? Yeah. You're going to come out and see us do some electric fishing surveying. Brilliant. So join us on our salmon special again next week on Wild when uh, we'll be uh, getting uh, buzzy in the water. That's right. <laughs>